Wonderful. Listen, Pat is going to come and he's going to share for the next few minutes a little of what God has done in his life in the past six months. So, Pat, I want to hand over to you. Um, you want to go for it? Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. And, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Pat. And uh, I've been um, here at Christ City Church since 2016. And it's a wonderful church. And what has God been teaching me? In chapter five of Mark's gospel, there is a man who just had his life changed by an encounter with Jesus. It reads in Mark 5, 18, 20. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged him, begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but says, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the, the capitalists how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Recently, God has been graciously revealing to me why I was chosen. God in his wisdom selected this group of men and women we read about in the gospel to be beneficiaries of his grace, mercy and goodness. In selecting them, he went not to the proud, the mighty, the famous or the brilliant. He went instead to the humble, the sick, to the unfortunate. He went right to the drunkard, to the so-called weakling of the world. To my weak and feeble hands, God has entrusted me a power beyond estimate. I've been given that which has been denied the brightest of people. God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, the weak things to shame the strong. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. So during this year in lockdown, it seems God has been saying to me, Pat, you are not selected because of your exceptional talents. And to be careful always, because if you're successful in beating alcoholism, then it won't be through your superiority or effort, but only by virtue of my grace and mercy. If God had wanted learned men to accomplish this mission, this power would have been given and trusted to the physician or scientist, perhaps. If God had wanted scholarly men, the world is filled better qualified men than me who would be available. Yet, God selected me because I've been an outcast of the world. And my long experience as an alcoholic has made me humbly alert to the cries of distress that comes from the despairing despair of alcoholics, addicts, and their families everywhere. It is important to keep in mind the admission I made on the day of my sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous, the 17th of November, 1988, namely that I was powerless, insane, my life unmanageable, and that it was only through God's desire and willingness to turn my will and my life onto his protection and care that relief came. My encouragement to the church is this, Ephesians 6, 10, 18, to be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, put on the full armor of God, Go check it out, read Ephesians 6 and the word Paul had to encourage the church at Ephesus. I want my fam family at Christ City Church to be encouraged by the same words. And finally, how can the church pray for me? Ephesians 6, 19 to 20. And pray for me that words may be given when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news of salvation for which I am an ambassador in chains, and pray that in proclaiming it, I may speak, bold, speak boldly and, encourage, and courageously as I should. I have access to my people that others do not. When I meet alcoholic friends anywhere, I speak their language. I know their pain, suffering and despair. When they say to me, what would you know, Pat? You're clean, sober, loaded and in your right mind, I can say to them, I too once stumbled and staggered drunk in this world. Listen, my friend, let me tell you what God has done for me. And what the good Lord has done for me, he can do for you too. So pray for boldness that in proclaiming the gospel, 
that I may be a faithful ambassador and servant with whoever I'm with. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you, Christ City Church. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen, Pat. Thank you so much. Wow. Pat, I want to pray for you. And then we're, we're going to go over to our reading. Uh, God, I, I thank you for what you have entrusted to Pat. Uh, I thank you, God, for the words that you've given Pat. And, uh, and I thank you, God, that, um, that, that you chose the foolish uh, to shame the wise, that you chose the weak to shame the strong. And, and I thank you, Father, that, um, that you have not left Pat where he, where he was, but you have redeemed him and you have restored him. And you are in the process of making him more and more like your son, Jesus. And I thank you that in the past five minutes that we have heard about Pat, we have just saw that he has given all glory over to you, God. And, and God, may that be a lesson and may that be an encouragement for all of us that, that, that in everything in life that we would give you the glory, God, for who you are and for what you've done. And so, God, I pray just for the, the coming year and years in Pat's life that he would be a man who can speak boldly and can speak courageously of you when the opportunity comes. I thank you, God, that you have placed him where, uh, where he is, that he has access to, to those struggling with alcoholism and those struggling with addiction, and that he can be a, a, an ambassador for Christ in those places. And so, God, I pray that, um, that, that we as a church family will be fit to support, to encourage, and to, and, and to build Pat up in his endeavours in seeing your name um, magnified here in Ireland. In your name. Amen. Amen. I, I want to hand over to Kieran. He's going to do our, our reading now. Okay, so I'll read from uh, Galatians 6, 1 to 10. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap. And if we do not give up. If we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Um, and I'll just pray for, for Joan before I hand over. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, what we heard last night from Joan. We thank you for Joan, and um, we pray that um, you'd speak through her again this morning and empower her words, and pray that um, as we listen, we will be uh, challenged and encouraged um, and we pray this in Jesus name Amen Hi, morning everybody it's great to see you I didn't take part in the Malteser challenge because I was scared that if I tried to put my head back that far I would do myself an injury and then <laughs> not be able to talk but great to see it so last night uh, we thought about why we care and this morning we're going to think about how we care and I want to start by just showing you a little video of an elephant. Okay, so watch carefully and enjoy. Here we go.
I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, that's a very good picture, I think, of caring, isn't it? Sometimes it's as though you have to get into the ditch beside the person in need and help them get out. But here's the question, and we'll come back to this later. What if that little elephant the next day went over to the edge of the ditch and fell in again by accident? Or what if it thought, well, that was good fun. I'll have a slide and um, my mother or big elephant, whoever it is, will come and push me out. So we need to think about that. So hold that picture in your mind as we think about now careful caring. Um, and I hope you can all see that on the screen. So here we go. It might seem, um, sorry, firstly, I want you to do something up to me slightly. If you've got a pen or paper, or you can put it in the Padlet, what I'd like you to do is take just a minute to think about a time in your life when you were cared for well, okay? What is the experience of being cared for? It could be from one person, could be from a small group, it could be from church in general. And I want you to try and write down what was it about that caring that made it really helpful? What was it about that was said or done that was helpful? And also that was helpful in helping you in your relationship with God. Okay, so if you can just take a minute to write down some of those things. Because sometimes we fail to learn our own experience. Because if we, we receive good care from somebody else, then it's good to think about that and think then about putting that into practice. Okay, you can add more to that later if you want. And um, I can't see what you've written at the minute because the is working here, but I'll read them all later. Um, it may seem odd now that in terms of careful caring, that I'm going to talk about some of the dangers in caring or things that we need to be aware of. The reason I'm doing that is because sometimes people give up caring because they get into difficulty or they just, they just, they realize their caring isn't, isn't as good as it could be. So in our caring, we need to think about how we care for others, but we need to think about how we care for ourselves in that. And we also need to think that as far as possible, we're caring in a way that honors God and that is truly biblical, okay? So the first thing I want us to think about is this. The first danger, if you like, in, um, in caring. Giving from depleted resources. In other words, not caring for yourself. It's important that we know God's truth and God's love for ourselves if we're really going to speak the truth and love to others. When we know that our relationship with God is strong, then that's our security and our stability. So we need to be keeping in the word in the Bible, on our own, with others, in small groups. We need to be actively involved in church, actively involved and taking part and under church's discipline. And we need to keep reading loads of Christian books out there, sorts of topics that are really helpful because we want to grow. And if I can put it like this, um, Imagine that when you committed your life to God, it was though you put on a pair of glasses and those glasses say, I trust God, I'm following God. Then everything that happens to you in life through those glasses. If you don't have those glasses on, then not what happens is you're trying to decide what God is like by what happens in life. And if you do that, Today, God is good, but tomorrow, he doesn't seem as good. Do you understand? It's very important that it's as though, I suppose I think of a bit like the marriage service. That when I committed my life to God, it was as though I was saying to God, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. And then the next, because it isn't until death has departed because we're never going to be parted from God when we know him. So 
it, we've made that commitment to God and therefore it's important that we keep growing because as we quoted last night and it's in your booklet, we need to be receiving comfort from God, from God and input from God to have anything worth giving to other people. Do you imagine a tank of water and you have an in pipe coming in and you have an out pipe going out? If more is going out than is coming in, the tank gets empty. And I'm not an engineer. That's just very simple. Same with us. The only thing we've got to give out to other people is what we're receiving from God. And it's very important that we keep growing daily in that. And I've got another illustration for you. And I'm on a swivel chair, so I should be able to do this, I hope. And it's this. Sometimes in my life, it's as though instead of looking at God, I do this. Now, hopefully this will work. And I'm going, Lord, where are you? Why don't you care? And it's as though God is saying, don't turn. Have you ever known people who've done that? They're really struggling and they walk away from fellowship. And they walk away, as it were, from God. And they're saying, but God doesn't care, but they're not looking to God. God can cope with our problems, with our questions. If you read through the Psalms, you will see there's lots of questions there brought to God. So whatever we're going through, it's very important that we keep in church, keep in fellowship, keep studying the Bible, keep praying. The second difficulty is not clarifying your role. I think this is a something that stops people caring or makes them want to give up. So you hear the need or somebody starts to talk with you. You ask them how they are and they're enough to be honest and to answer. And you start panicking because you feel under pressure because you think, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to help them. I can't sort out their problems. I can't fix their life for them. And you wish you had never asked. But the thing is, God's not asking you to fix their life. And God isn't asking you to fix their problems. And some people's problems can't be fixed. But God is asking you to show them care and to get them the care they need. I think about it a bit like this. Imagine a really good GP. And I hope you've all got a good GP. Imagine a really good GP. If you go to your GP and start sharing your symptoms, the GP's role is to find the help that you need. If you've got a broken leg, it is not helpful if the GP says, oh, I'll just put a wee bandage around that now and away you go and you'll be fine. The GP needs to refer you to get the help that you need. And I think that can actually take the pressure off a lot of people. You think of yourself, it's great if somebody opens up and is honest to you. And instead of panicking and thinking, help, I can't sort you out. That's not what God's asking me to do. God's asking you to listen and care and to think, what's the best way of helping this person? So that can take a lot of the pressure off you. Maybe the person is stuck. Virtually, they've walked away from fellowship. Maybe you need to get them re-engaged. Maybe you need to offer that they go and talk to somebody else. And we'll talk about that later, okay? About referral. But take the pressure off yourself. Be pleased if somebody else opens up to you. And don't think, I have got to fix it. Because you don't. Have you ever had the experience Face to face, well, we could do that, or on the phone, or on Zoom. And you're having this conversation with somebody, and it can go on for 20 minutes, half an hour, and all you're doing is saying, uh huh, yeah, really? Oh dear. And at the end, they say, oh, thank you so much, you were so helpful. And, but what did I do? You listened, and you listened carefully. And sometimes, what so many of us want is somebody else who would just give us time and listen carefully and not think they have to fix it. Okay, so next 
issue is what I call the Elijah syndrome. And if you want to know why I call it the Elijah syndrome, read 1 Kings 19 or ask Vanessa, <laughs> because we did that in class. Because Elijah, one of the things Elijah says more than once to God is that I'm the only one. A bit like Eeyore. Has any of you read Winnie the Pooh? Winnie the Pooh? I'm a great fan of Winnie the Pooh. Great characters in there. Um, but Eeyore is a bit like that. Poor Eeyore. Poor mournful Eeyore. Be careful that you don't get into that kind of syndrome. Nobody can help people in the way I can help them. If you are talking to somebody, it's important to find out, does anybody else know what they're telling you? But just be careful of thinking that you're God's answer to everybody. <laughs> you're not. I'm not. We're not. But together, together, God enables us to care for people. What about this one? And this was raised last night in the questions by, I, oh, I, can't, I think it might have been Laura, but I can't remember. Anyway, good question. This is a major issue, us getting weighed down by others' problems. And we need to think about this. Now, um, we read Galatians 6 together. And if you have that open, if you can see that in front of you, we're just going to look at that. And if not, I've put the verses here, verse 2, 9, and 10. Okay? Verse 2 couldn't be clearer, could it? Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. That's not difficult to understand. It might be difficult to follow, but that's perfectly clear. And then look at 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. And isn't this interesting? Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Somebody said to me once, Joan, is pastoral care, Christian care, introverted looking when there's a world out there who need to hear about Jesus? But as I said last night, it's not. Because people out there who don't know Jesus need to know God's truth and his care. So it is very outward looking. But it is important that we care for each other in the body of Christ. But those of you who read carefully, if you look at Galatians 6, Look at verse 5. Have a little look at verse 5. Because verse 5 says this. For each one should carry their own load. So what does that mean? Does the Bible contradict itself? No, it doesn't. It doesn't ever. If I can put it like this, and this is why it's very important. We are responsible to God for our behavior and our life. So I am not responsible for what you do, but I am responsible to care for you. And um, somebody put it like this once to me, it's almost as though we've each got our own backpack, that sometimes somebody's got a heavy suitcase that we need to carry. If I can give you a really, a really extreme example, and I'm sorry if this is painful or relevant for any of you, but it was something that did happen to me once. That's you, you're helping somebody who's in deep depression, and you're doing all that you can to help them. And how do you live with that? You come back to Galatians 6. You do what you can to carry somebody else's burdens, but you are not answerable to God for what they do. You need to think about that, and if you have questions about that, come back to me later. It's a very difficult issue. The thing that has stopped some people caring, because they get too wrapped up in other people's problems, and they almost want, it's almost like taking over the other person's life. It sounds hard to say this, but you need to really care and you need to keep some distance. That's the biblical way. And Galatians 6 matters. And if you look at Galatians 6, look at verse 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. 
The one who sowed to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Think back to the little video at the beginning, the elephant. Baby elephant kept going back and deliberately or falling into that, that ditch. The most helpful thing would be for the parent of that elephant or one of the other elephants to have a good chat. Sorry, I know I'm going beyond that chat, you know what I mean? To chat to that baby elephant about the foolishness of the behaviour. Are you with me? Think that through. That sometimes caring for people doesn't mean keeping pushing, pulling them out of the ditch. But that's not a decision to make lightly, and it's not one I think you should make on your own. Okay, what about this one then? Being pragmatic rather than theological. back to a relevant question that Katie asked last night about truth and love. Being pragmatic means saying something that somebody will like and it might actually help them for that day. It might actually make them feel better but it's not what God is saying. Theological means, theology means knowledge of God. Isn't that what we all want? We all want theology. So being, be, we need to be theological in how we help people. We need to always, always honour God because it will only help people long term. And in the society that we're living in, at the moment, it is difficult. But the best way that we can help people is be, by being enthusiastic about God's truth and what he has said. So being pragmatic only. It's interesting, isn't it? This is one of the most well-known verses, two verses in scripture about the Bible. Sometimes, you know, and sometimes people in IBI, other staff say it to me just to tease me, but they'll say things to me like, Joan, well, isn't Pastor Kel just all warm and fuzzy? You know, just send if you're there, there, it's all fine. You know, just do what you like and I'll, I'll care for you. These verses of what God says about scripture and what it's for, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, we are responsible that we do that graciously. Okay? But we need to be very aware that to truly care for people, we need to really speak the truth. And I'm going to read a little bit to you now from a book. It says this, and it's talking about truly caring in your friendships. If true intimacy is to develop, we must be willing to be honest with our friends, not only about our own feelings, but also when appropriate about theirs. Very often it is love for myself and a fear of being badly received, rather than a love for my friends, that holds me back from speaking an uncomfortable truth to them. But if I only praise them and never point out, I'm certainly not helping them. Now, don't you all wish that you had a book like that that said wisdom like that so that you could read? Can you see? I haven't read that book before this morning. That book arrived in your care pack. And it has such wisdom in it that please, we all have it, and that's actually on page 58. But please don't go and read it now. <laughs> Keep it for later. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine you all now sitting reading the whole book. Well, that would probably be very helpful, but you can do that later, okay? So, um, think you really care for people. Here's a strange thing. Whenever God speaks to me and points out things in my life that are wrong, if he does it through a sermon in church, or if he does it when I'm reading the Bible on my own, it might be hard, but I can kind of cope. You see, when he dares to do it for, by another Christian, why is that so hard? Why do I find it hard when he does it from my nearest and dearest and my best friends? That's worth thinking about. We say that we want to grow. We say that we're not perfect. And yet if somebody else dares to point that out to us, the shields can go up. 
and we can get the census. So think about that. What about this one? Sexual vulnerability. And this verse is very important. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Um, when, when I got married to Stephen, um, Stephen was at London Bible College. And um, so we were living there in London. And one night, literally, one of the members of staff from that college left, left a wife and four children and left with one of the female students that he had been helping. That was really shocking. You can imagine that was very difficult in that Bible college and the guy's brother was also on staff. I remember at that time saying to Stephen, Stephen, I am so, so glad that I know that you would never do that. Stephen said, Joan, that's not true. <laughs> I was so shocked and terrified. I said, what do you mean? He said, during the day that I think that I couldn't is the day that I'm in danger. Don't think you're immune. Don't think that you're okay. Just be very, just listen to God's warning when he kind of warns you about sticking you yourself into and being alone with somebody and hearing intimate details. Don't ignore that. Be very careful about that. What about this one? Losing trust and confidence in God, his truth and his goodness. And I said it last night and I'll say it again. If you're doubting, if you have doubts about God, his truth, his goodness, his care, go and talk to somebody. Don't live on like that. Because you need to have that foundation that God is true so that you're not apologetic for what God says, but you're enthusiastic to people and people around you and say, this is what God says and it's good and it's the best way to live, etc. So we need to go back to getting that input, as I said before, for ourselves. And this, this is a day of forgetting why you care. Go back to some of the stuff that we talked about last night. Remind yourself of why you care. Because of God is a caring God. Because God has shown people the best way to live. Because we're made in the image of God. Because God cares about people. Because we're a body and we're interconnected. Because it's contagious. Because it's a wonderful witness if we truly care for people. And then what about this? This is a major difficulty. If we don't our limitations. Now, we don't have a lot of time to go into this, but I am going to give you just a few headings about this that I hope will help you. Thinking about yourself and understanding your own limitations. Um, I don't know if you can see that little cartoon. So in the background, in a house across the way, there's two voices. One says, you cheating slug. And the other voice says, what are you doing with that knife? And this lady in her room listening picks up the telephone. Yeah, you know what those things are, an old telephone. And she says, I was going to phone the police, but then I thought, no, what they need is a pastoral call. <laughs> I think she needs to phone the guard. So in other words, it's very important that we understand our limitations. So here's, here's a first limitation. And this is the nature of the issue. There are some issues that by themselves, may need, will need more specialist expert help than you alone can give. It doesn't mean that you don't care. Some of the be issues of addiction, eating disorders, child abuse, issues to do with the occult, sexual issues. And as I said before, you're not helping people if you don't get them the help that they need. So the first thing is the nature of the issue itself. Some issues will need more help helping if you get people the help that they need. Second thing is this though, the duration and depth of the issue. So if somebody says to you, I've been feeling really down, just feeling very lackluster, depressed, whatever, for the last two weeks. That's very different if somebody says to you, I've been feeling like this for the past year. 
one of the things I know that doctors look for in terms of depression is how much is this affecting the person's normal functioning? That's a good question to keep in your mind. So it isn't just the duration of the issue, it's the depth of the issue. Somebody's talking to you about an issue, say it's depression, they're not going to work, they're not looking after themselves. That's very different from somebody that is still reasonably functioning. So that's something else to think about. So the nature of the issue, the duration and the depth of the issue, the relationship of the person to you. Do you know that you're not always the best person to help those who are very close to you? That's not a weakness. That's just a fact that sometimes people need to talk to somebody who's more outside the situation. It's why some people, even though they've got somebody within their church who can give really in-depth pastoral counselling, go and talk to a Christian counsellor who you respect and trust. Because they need to talk to somebody outside the situation. For instance, if, I, if Stephen and I are having difficulty in our marriage, I would be very reluctant to go and talk to my pastor because Stephen is in the church. Do you know what I mean? So just sometimes close to the person. It doesn't mean that we don't care, but actually that can be a limiting factor. As can time. Don't ignore this. Don't ignore this. God has given us a certain time week, time, you may not have time in your life at the minute to help others in the in-depth way that you would like to. This one, lack of knowledge experience. Don't rush in to think. I always say this to my pastoral care classes in IBI. Please don't think that because you've come and done 13 weeks pastoral care class that you're now going to set yourself up as, come to me, everybody. <laughs> Come to me, I will help you with all your issues in life. We need to know ourselves. We need to know things that we feel we can handle and things that we just feel we may need to refer the person to somebody else. Your own health, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. Know yourself, know where you're at, to know whether you can, how much help you can give. Your own family, and with that, I mean responsibilities. And by family, I mean those who are nearest and dearest to you. So you may be caring for people who are very close to you, so you don't have the same time now to give to other people. Don't ignore that. And I've something just to show you about that later. What about this? The effect of the issue on you, raw for you. You do not have to have experienced depression to help somebody else who's struggling with it. You don't have to have experienced bereavement to help somebody else. Some, if you've been recently bereaved, you may not be the best person to help somebody else. You might, but you might not. Sometimes the issue, whatever it is, is so, as it were, raw for you. Don't ignore that. It doesn't mean you don't care. It means that you're being wise and you're caring. Here's a good question. Back to that thing of getting weighed down by other people's problems. How much are you thinking about it and about them? Is it affecting your sleep? Because if it is, that's not good. Really, it isn't. Now, I don't mean that you, you wake up and then pray for them. But if this is going on and you're not sleeping, nights then you need to go and talk to somebody and you need to get input and this lack of support and supervision for you and I deliberately put supervision in inverted commas I don't mean formal su supervision but what support you've got in your life might be a limiting factor for how much you can care for others and this one is no easy way to explain this except don't ignore it you just feel uneasy. Trust God when he makes you feel uneasy. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Doesn't mean that you ignore the person, but you think of how you can get them the best help that they need. 
That was a very, very quick um, run through. Can I just say something about referral? Very important that you know right now that if you felt more help than you can give, that you know who in church you would encourage them to go and talk to. And that's not necessarily only the staff, but that you know other people in church you could go and get them to talk to. Don't just leave them. You need to get the person the help that they need. You need to know who you would, who you would refer them to as it were, encourage them to talk to. I also think, as I said before, there are very good biblical Christian counsellors working in Ireland. And I have a list of ones that I respect and trust. Sometimes the best thing you can do for somebody, and some of those people are actually doing it now by phone or on Zoom. So do you know who you can refer people to? Okay. And just before we finish, I'm going to run through this very quickly because the other side of the other side of being aware of these dangers is taking care of ourselves. Look at what Paul said. Now he was speaking to the elders, and the principle still applies to us. Teach watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. He didn't say just keep watch over the flock, keep watch over yourself. And look what Paul says to Timothy. Watch your life and doctrine closely. them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So what you believe, what you live by, the truth you hold to, and how you live matters. And I am going to rattle through these things now, okay? <laughs> you can come back to me later then about them. Know God's love and truth for yourself. As I said earlier, keep involved in church and fellowship. Accept care from others. Don't become like some sort of super terror. You need care from other people. Now, you're going to think, oh, Joan, this is so basic. But if you read 1 Kings 19, what God gave Elijah, he gave him sleep, and then he gave him food, and then he gave him more sleep, food, and something to drink. I can't tell you what adequate sleep is, but, you know, good diet and exercise, keep ourselves, keep the body that God gave us healthy. Recreation, ways that you feed into yourself, you know, recreation, time off and switching off, time when you are doing things that are good for you, you know, friends and fun like the Malteser thing or whatever, or whatever lip sync thing you're doing tonight. These things matter. It's how God has made us that we need those things. Know yourself worth before God apart from helping others. That's, and I could talk for an hour about that one, but I won't. <laughs> it's very important that you don't feel that you're of value because you're caring for somebody else. That is where the dependence thing can come in. So know yourself worth with God, apart from helping others. Know your limitations and set boundaries. Be available to God 100%, 24-7. One of the most useful things I've learned in my life is that that's not the same thing as being available to every person or every need that arises. It's not the same thing. Encourage and enable others to care. Think of ways that you can actually encourage each other to care. Do not neglect your own those closest to you. Here's your real danger. We hear all this and we're thinking, oh yes, I'm going to care for all those other people. And the people who are actually closest to us, well, we just relax with them. So we don't necessarily need to care for them. Okay? And be biblically wise, do not ignore the dangers. Can you see this little cartoon? There's a guy in a bed, patient. And the woman is saying, I presume it's to the nurse or somebody, John says you've all been compassionate and caring. Would you please stop or you'll expect that at home? So just be careful. You don't ignore actually the people who are closest to you and you're doing your caring as it were, you know, out there. Yeah. Last word. Remind yourself why you care. 
You care because God loves you and you love God and you're walking in his truth. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And on the basis of that, love your neighbor as yourself. Can I ask you to do something? I was going to get you to do this in breakout rooms, but time is gone. Can I ask you to do something again, just for one minute? I want you to look back, if you've taken notes, look back at some of those dangers and just ask God to point out to you which of those you feel are most prone to. Okay? And then you may want to go and talk to somebody about it. It may be that you don't understand your limitations, but it may be some of these other things. So just take a minute or two quietly and then I'll pray. I'm done. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you, you have redeemed us, you have brought us into your family. Father, thank you that you've made each one of us as unique um, people that you want to use. Father, just we pray that you would help each of us to know you deeply, to know ourselves, and to know how it is you want us to care for others. Father, help us to keep caring, but help us to do it wisely, biblically, in a way that honours you. So, Father, we just do commit our sins through these things to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. And please do read what's on the tablet. I've just seen it, and wonderful stuff there. So do read that and do add into that if you want. Thank you. Thank you, John. What, what a trove of wisdom. That's wonderful. I want to pass you over to Chloe now, and she has got something for each of us before we, before we finish off this session. Correct. Thank you. Uh, great. So, as you know, everyone um, hopefully donated money, uh, and that included the care package. Um, so I have four, four great charities that um, we get to vote on in a few minutes of which one we'd like the weekend money to go towards. Each charity is going to get money, um, but just what the money is going to go towards. So um, the first one I have is Lighthouse. Um, and a lot of you may know about the Lighthouse. As a few people volunteer and our very own Anto and Leanne work with Lighthouse. Um, and they tell me since COVID Lighthouse has adapted and has switched from a drop-in service um, to takeaway meals. Um, and since March, Lighthouse has distributed 60,000 meal packs, which is amazing. And even with all the restrictions they've told, it's been amazing to see God working. Um, yeah, so that's just unbelievable. Um, my second charity I have chosen is Cold Vember. So this is led by the student kind of gang in church um, involving like Andrew and Stephen Tutty and Isaac. And um, now many of you may have heard of Movember, um, but unfortunately this gang can't grow mustaches. So they've done Coldvember instead. Um, so that is, they're doing is taking the plunge into the Irish Sea every day in November. Um, and they're running, they're raising money for Tig Lynn, who work throughout Ireland, helping people with addiction and homelessness. Um, now, Steve uh, is our pro sea swimmer. Um, he's been swimming like for two months or something. Uh, and he said he joined them the other day and they all squealed. So yeah, it's probably not, it's probably a sight to see anyway. <laughs> um, and I know this year is different, but usually I think they meet down in Sea Point kind of area, uh, which unfortunately is not within my 5K. So maybe another year I'll join. <laughs> um, <laughs> but probably not. Um, 
then I have another charity called Alone. Um, and it's a great Irish charity as well. They provide housing, support, befriending um, to hundreds of older people every week who are homeless or socially isolated um, and living in or living in deprivation or in a crisis. So I think that more than ever um, is such a key charity as well. Um, and then my fourth charity, which is one that's very dear to all of our hearts um, and it's very hard to ignore um, and not to deal with. And that is the crime against fashion. That is Steve's fingerless gloves um, that attacks our eyes every week. Um, <laughs> so now we have, uh, yeah, we need to get him some full size gloves, I think. Um, so now we get to vote. Um, and how does that, we get a poll now in a second and you get a vote on which one you think the weekend money should go towards. Mm -hmm. Is it Lighthouse? Is it Tiglin via Cold Vember and support those ones? Those guys, yeah, jumping in the sea every day and squealing, apparently. Or will it be alone? And each one will get money as well. So it's not just, I've told you about these nice charities and now no one's getting money. So which one will it be? Ah, Steve's, well, Leanne says he has full size gloves. These ones are just for typing. It's still not okay. And it's still not excusable to wear fingerless gloves <laughs> in public. Do it on your own. Oh, thank you guys. <laughs> don't be Nevada. How do you, I don't know how the poll, oh, poll, oh, it's, it's ended. So we have the lighthouse, congrats. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you can still support all the other charities as well. Um, and yeah, but brilliant. Lighthouse is getting the weekend away money. Cool, I'll pass back over to, uh, to Mappy now and mute myself. I think that was everyone I had to slag off anyway. I had on my paper, so <laughs> done. That's wonderful, Chloe. Well done. Thank you very much. It is fantastic that Chloe can get away with that. And so that's why we don't have a staff member that does that poll. So well done, Chloe. Appreciate that. And we know Steve appreciates it as well. Guys, that is the end of our session. Um, I apologise, we've run slightly over, but hopefully you're okay with that. Uh, if you take a look on the screen, we can see the next sessions. Uh, there's actually a one o'clock lunch. It's not 12. I made a mistake there. My bad. There's a 12 o'clock lunch. So I, I don't know. I'd encourage you maybe grab a cup of tea and a little 11 o'clock snack now. But then at one o'clock, jump on Zoom and there will be a few of us on there to have a Zoom lunch. Look at that. It's been updated and live. That's incredible. Well done, Vanessa. So listen, there's a song going on in the background. Again, it's my favourite song. And then there's a Q&A with Joan. So feel free to hang around and throw a ton of difficult questions at her. This is one of my favourite parts of being at IBI, is you can literally ask Joan anything and then sit back and watch her respond. And so again, make use of the Padlet, make use of the photo challenge. That's going to be part of our icebreaker on Sunday. So let's see who's going to win. And then simply think how you can bless your body this weekend. So you can see the next sessions and we look forward to seeing you the rest of the weekend. Take care, guys. Have fun and see you soon.